Um, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Um, so I'm going to introduce myself. I'm going to introduce um, Mark and Victoria, and then I'm going to walk you through the microloan charity, and then um, I'm going to let Victoria run the process. This is what we're going to do. So my name is Gita Silurov, and I'm the founder and CEO of Nosh Detox, and I'm also the chair of the Women's Development Board um, uh, at Microloan Foundation. So today I, I want to just start by letting you, uh, introducing you to our speakers, just so that you know that we're not going to just talk charity to you. We've got some fantastic stuff coming afterwards. So I want to start with um, Mark. And Mark is... I mean, you're really fascinating, actually, Mark, because Mark joined the Financial Times Live in, two, you smiled when I said you were fascinating, <laughs> in 2016. And since COVID, you were instrumental in moving all your physical conferences um, to virtual events. And you helped to set up and run FT Global Boardroom, which had a three-day conference, which had 53,000 registrations which gives me hives just thinking about that actually. 53,000 people coming onto our platform and having to manage that. And then we've got Victoria Pawsey, who's also on the Women's Development Board and is an all round fabulous woman who I actually know. And she's senior client relations and marketing leader. She works as a B2B marketing consultant and strategist, and she supports brands across a range of sectors globally. So Victoria has always been very instrumental in organizing events and post COVID, she's been supporting clients on their virtual events and had actually has been doing that for us as microloan. Charities have been massively hit because you don't think about helping other people when your life's just basically imploding all around you on every level. And Victoria has been fantastic at talking about uh, virtual events, helping us to take all our philanthropy uh, events online. And I'm super grateful. So I'm um, thank you very much to both of you um for joining us and so i'm going to tell you a little bit now about the charity and then i will hand you back to victoria to run everything in her beautiful inimitable way um so microloan um as i was saying that it's it's, it's a charity that um what we do in microloan is we help some of the poorest women in sub-saharan africa and we specialize in 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 basically three countries which is malawi malawi zambia and zimbabwe and the reason i became involved in microloan is because i'm actually from malawi i was born and brought up in malawi and so when i heard about microloan um it was 100 percent aligned with everything that i knew that i believed in and and that i cared about um, we have women here that are living on less than a pound a day and they're really really struggling to feed their children in fact now more than ever before so microloan helps these women by giving them access to micro loans small loans and practical business training and then they we help them to set up businesses using the loans that we give them they, when, when you give somebody, it's that thing of teaching someone to fish or giving them a fish. When you give people who are very, very poor money, that money will immediately go to food. So it is a skill set that we've developed in Microloan where we actually help these women to set up businesses so that they are constantly making money and making profits and then using those profits to, you know, buy shelter, food, healthcare, and every single opportunity that otherwise they wouldn't have because they are literally the poorest of the poor. And then they're women. So they have no rights as well as being the poorest of the poor. And what we do in Microloan is we fund the women, we fund groups of women, and we help them as small groups to learn and grow together and build their businesses. Since Microloan was founded in 2002, um, we've helped over 243,000 women to build businesses, and that has benefited 972,000 children, which is utterly phenomenal. So I am so, so grateful that you came today. I'm so grateful that you bought a ticket to come today. Please don't resist any urges you may have to go off and look at the microloan website and absolutely give us donations the interesting thing about microloan is that a, lo a loan of 25 pounds will totally change the world of one of these women they're just it's not big money we're really don't don't have coffee for a week and, and change a woman's life 
Um, so that's the end of my part of it. And I'm now going to give Victoria the opportunity to take over. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, Geeta. That was great. And um, I am just going to share my screen. And I just need the host to enable me to be able to do that. My technical assistant in the background. There we go. Lovely. Okay, so just give me a couple of seconds to get this all up and running. There we go. Right, so today, thank you, Gita, we're going to be talking about, and the reason that you've all attended this webinar is to talk about the event landscape post COVID 19. Um, and really, we're going to be talking about what the impact has been right across not just B2B events, which is the world that I live in most of the time, but across B2C events as well. So the arts, lifestyle, sports, um, because really events as we know them have been um, completely changed. And certainly our attendees' behaviours when we're attending events in the virtual world have been um, really changing over the last, even over the last couple of months since we have had this um, complete uh, change in our, our events world. So I want to talk today about what innovations um, across the events market this is, this is forcing um, and what is best practice when it comes to virtual events, whether that's deciding to attend an event or deciding whether to sponsor an event or even if you're running events yourselves. Um, and then, of course, the future. Where do we go from here? How much of the last couple of months has been lasting change? Certainly, nobody could have expected um, the impact that COVID-19 uh, has had on the events market. And it does feel very much like this photo that the world is temporarily closed. And I got a sense of it um, really way before we went down into lockdown um, when I was supporting a client around Mobile World Congress, which, if you don't know, is an absolutely enormous uh, telco event that happens in Barcelona every year and it wasn't interestingly there it wasn't the event company or in this case the association that runs that event called the GSMA that decided to stop that event it was the sponsors supporting that event that started to pull out of the event thick and fast and it was very much a domino effect that it was almost every day there was a new press release that came out to say one brand Samsung Huawei had pulled out of that event and I think a lot of the behavior that people are kind of looking to when when we're looking at you know when are the physical events going to come back into our lives again is around that sort of personal sense of responsibility or a brand sense of responsibility around what's right for their audience and what's right for them as an organization and I think we're going to see that um, more and more to come um, but the impact of, you know right across the globe on events um obviously you know every sport under the sun pretty much has had to stop um and even you know events like the ideal home show which has run for 112 years would you believe it through wars and recessions and depressions um even that's had to postpone for the first time this year um but i guess that sense of personal responsibility is something that i think will become a real trend for the future and i know that a lot of event companies are grappling with that moving forward in their strategy to really you know work out how not only how do they keep their attendees safe and keep their sponsors happy but how do they keep their staff safe as well so um once the event world changed, then came on of invitations that I know that you will have received to various virtual events. And um, believe me, the irony of talking about virtual events on a virtual event is not lost on me right now. But I think it um, certainly has become quite fashionable. Uh, indeed, you know, you've got the rise of webinars and online events, not only being something that you do in your business world, doing your kind of virtual um, town halls, but they've permeated the home. Um, I'm sure you've all been on kind of house party quizzes and doing lots of um, fun games with your nearest and dearest from a virtual point of view because we've had to. And I think, you know, who would have known that your granny would have become so tech savvy? What this has done is it's forced um, a change that I do think is lasting around anybody who was a, perhaps a reluctant um, 
tech adopter really having to get their head around some of these things so whether you're attending um, you know a huge symposium a drop-in a virtual roundtable a digital festival or doing um, yoga in the morning with your favorite yoga instructor on Instagram or perhaps going to watch your favorite band live we are engaging um, from a virtual point of view at the moment all the time and um, those of there would be some of us that would be quite used to doing that. But I think now we are seeing that change um, that, that even those people that are tech reluctant are, are starting to move to that. Of course, we mentioned it earlier, all of this has led to a bit of Zoom fatigue. Um, and I guess if we're interested in events, which most of the, us on the call here today will be, um, the tricky thing in terms of working out your lasting strategy is how much of this is going to change um, for the future. And my view is that um, if working from home is going to be a lasting change out of COVID-19, and we're seeing everything pointing to that being the case, so the CEO of Barclays and the CEO of WPP saying that actually 2,000 people working together in, a, in an office is a thing of the past, um, I do think that people will be more choosy about the events uh, that they want to attend in person, particularly if there is an excellent virtual offering as an alternative. And there'll be new things that will come into play to make that probably that slight, slightly higher price point, but also that um, that use of their time. You know, we have to travel to these things. We have to plan our route there and back. So, you know, being able to attend things virtually does make things much more convenient for people. Um, how do we combat Zoom fatigue as an organization? So if you're running events, um, how do you know how much is too much? Um, I think really talking to your audience and engaging with your audience around your digital strategy is really important. Um, working out perhaps how you can create different formats that you can use to your disposal. So virtual events are great, but there are also other means of communicating. So whether that be podcasts, um, podcasts are great because you can um, make them available on demand and it might be that you could use a strategy where you produce a virtual event on a particular theme and topic and then a podcast series running off the back of it um, would actually mean that you continuously engage that audience further on that same topic they just don't always have to kind of log into a live session um, gamification as well so what I mean by that is using different forms and mediums um, to engage your audience by letting them make decisions that inform them about a particular issue or topic. One of the best ones I've ever seen is actually one done by the FT, um, where you were an Uber driver and you had to go into this game and make various different decisions to try and create a profit for your little Uber business. And um, ultimately, and I played the, the game maybe seven or eight times because I'm competitive and I wanted to try and win and make a profit and I only managed to once. And thus, you know, it informed me that being part of the gig economy um, works on very small margins. And um, it was a really, really interactive way, um, a really funny way of, of, of showing that because it had a lot of really great jokes in it as we went through. Um, so moving on to kind of planning and thinking about your forward calendar, which is always um, the bugbear of every the bugbear of every uh, event planner, or or when we're kind of looking at which events we should select to attend or get involved with. Um, Obviously, the moment that the events uh, market kind of blew up with the lockdown. Um, the, the initial reaction from everybody was to move their events to the autumn. And so the autumn calendar is going to be very, very busy. Um, and I'm getting a lot of questions from clients at the moment as to whether or not um, they can actually run physical events in the autumn. And there seems to be um, a wildly differing view on this. Um, what I would say is September is still a very long way away. It is impossible to predict what's going to happen at the moment. Obviously, we have the risk of a second spike. Um, and so the best thing I can advise here is to be agile. Don't just have a plan A, have a plan B, have a plan C. And that's the same, again, whether you're an attendee of an event, a sponsor of an event, or you're running the event yourself. So creating a really effective digital strategy will mean that you can still engage with that audience um, and you can safeguard all of the effort that goes into planning events by knowing that if that event can't physically take place, um, you've got your fallback option um, from an online point of view. And actually running those things side by side can be incredibly powerful. 
Um, again, we've been looking at scheduling and aligning that to people's behavior and looking at people's behavior when they're attending virtual events. Um, and I know Mark's going to talk about this later in terms of the, what the FT are doing with their strategy, but do people um, want to attend a full day conference online or hour long snippets over a longer period of time better? To my mind, even at physical events, people have always dipped in and out of content. Um, the virtual uh, setting just means we've got much more visibility around that. Um, and I think data and the technology can be really insightful at being able to direct that content um, and really sort of help you to understand your audience, or if you're a sponsor, help you to understand which content that you're, that you're producing out into the market is working best. So technology is the bedrock of your event um, very much like your venue is the bedrock of your event the ben the venue that you decide to use speaks volumes about the type of event that you want to run and it will also give you flexibility so does it need to have meeting rooms does it need to have breakout rooms the exactly the same um, i think exactly the same premise applies when you're looking to your tech platform and here's just some of the logos um, it's just small uh, snapshot of many that are out there uh, that you can choose from and it's a bit of a minefield for people um, and so what I would urge you to do is to really think about what are the elements that are really important to you around your event and if you're sponsoring an event really engage with that event provider and talk to them about the platform that they're using so that you can make the most out of that and I think we're going to see huge innovation in this space um, certainly across all of the different publishers and clients that I've talked to that are running proprietary events it doesn't seem like there is a platform that um, is a one-stop shop for everything that everybody needs um, and they are all innovating at speed they've also as we were discussing earlier seen um, you know huge rise in the number of people that they're trying to service so I would also look at kind of some of the brands that you know you may not have heard of before obviously we all know zoom we're on a zoom call right now but I have been hearing that the, the uh, customer service that people have been experiencing um, from some of those providers that have seen huge numbers go to them has not been as good as they would expect so um, I think that really do your homework when you're kind of looking at tech and don't just rely on the event company to have made that decision you should be asking them about um, what tech platform they're using so you can make the most of it just want to draw your attention to podium in the bottom left hand corner so podium is a really interesting offering in the market that is um, being developed at the moment um, and that's a collaboration between an agency um, an event platform on 24 and then a content platform called turtle and they are really building an end-to-end -end solution so that the tech platform integrates with your content and integrates with your analytics and data that runs into your system and i think we're going to see a lot more innovation here um, obviously we've got huge swathes of data that we can pull from events and i think being into, able to integrate them into your crm system again gives you a much better picture of your overall audience um, and how you can then sort of um, push uh, more content to them that is going to be useful moving forward and how you can invite them to, to more events that you might be running. Really think about registration, really think about the app that you might want to engage your delegates to use. If it's a large scale event ahead of the event, how can they get more out um, of the event before that moment, especially when we know that people aren't necessarily engaging for a full day anymore. But I think that, that that point of engagement becomes a lot longer. And this brings me on to the subject of data. Um, I have a, a theory that what is happening in the events world is very similar to what happened in the digital advertising world um, with the advent of kind of programmatic advertising. And, you know, there where you placed an advertisement previously in print, you just had to go on the faith of looking at the media pack of that publication and knowing and trusting that that publication would be read by that audience. Suddenly, once we pushed all of our advertising on um, online, we can get a lot more information and a lot more data on who's actually looking at our content. Um, and I think there was an, an initial, um, you know, disappointment perhaps in the numbers, um, and that has been reflected in the pricing as well, which I'll come on to later. But I think the same disruption could be happening in events. And what I would say is that I don't think that this is a really bad thing. I think that likely content can become much more targeted um, and events can be much more targeted and we can use some of that data 
to really inform um, our, our content structure. And it can actually align with um, any digital strategy that you're, that you're doing, that, um, doing that with. So what does the future look like? I think we've all understood now that there are some lasting changes that are gonna, are gonna sort of keep with us out of COVID-19, even when the world goes back to normal and we can all go and attend um, festivals and uh, industry events again. Um, but I think what I would say is even in a virtual world, um, it is really important to create a live moment. Um, probably most of the people that are listening to this call are interested in events and, and one of the best things about events is the power of people coming together and that sense of electricity um, that we all feel when we're all kind of participating in something um, together and I think it's really important that we don't lose that moment. I think just creating content and pushing it out and having it available on demand won't help you to drive any kind of audience. Um, and similarly, if you're a sponsor engaging in an event or if you're an attendee engaging in an event, you're much more likely to do that if you feel that there, oh, there might be something I miss if I don't, if I don't get there at that time. So there needs to be that element of being special. Similarly, um, when it's special, we can really build in ways for people to interact with us. So can people ask live questions? Um, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end of this um, session today. Um, and so how can, how can people interact with you? Q&A is a really great way of doing it. Live polling is a really great way of doing it. Um, and then there are some more innovations kind of coming through, again, aligned to the different plat tech platforms. Um, the other thing I will say is that I think with virtual events, we're kind of tipping into the world of broadcasting slightly. And certainly some of the numbers that we're seeing attend events, um, we're going to talk to Mark later about having a, you know, 50,000 registrations for, for an event. That's, you know, the, the FT would have never been able to run, a, I don't think, a physical event with those kinds of numbers. So we start to kind of tip into that broadcasting um, uh, world. And so things like high quality video will become really important. Um, being able to use pre-roll um, for targeted audiences, um, again, will become really, really important. So if you're running, perhaps there's a, a TV chef running a cookery um, session on a virtual event, um, and you are a, um, you know, you're a maker of um, cookery utensils, actually putting a pre-roll in before that panel means that you've got a really, really targeted audience in the same way that you might run an advertisement before uh, the Great British Bake Off. So I think we can really start to see where we're starting to get high volume audiences um, that, that virtual events can be really, really impactful in the same way as broadcasting. The other um, element that I think we can learn from broadcasting is around the Netflix effect. And Netflix have obviously been wildly successful at using algorithms to um, inform their content decisions. Um, and they knew that for example, The Crown was gonna be a great success because they could see the data of similar shows um, and they could really put that into the content curation. And I think from a virtual event point of view, we're gonna be able to start to do the same thing. Um, we're also gonna have a huge amount of content that is available on demand that those that perhaps didn't attend an event and if we really feel like, oh, you missed out on a really good event here, but here's the on demand um, content that you can watch, people can start to watch that and we can then use that as an opportunity to push further events or to push other content pieces, again, podcasts, white papers, advertisements for future um, engagements, anything like that. You can really start like YouTube does when you watch a YouTube video, you know, you have the slide on the right. If you like this, then you're probably going to like this other content. We can really start to, to work with that. And I think we'll start to see event companies almost starting to work together um, to really kind of cross pollinate those different audiences. The other thought that I had around the Netflix effect is if you have a bank of content, whether you're a brand or whether you're an event company running lots of different content pieces, whether that be virtual events or um, you know, interviews, podcasts, et cetera, perhaps a subscription model um, for your events would work better than a delegate pass moving forward. Again, once, once we move virtual, if you think about how you interact with things that are virtual that you pay for, um, subscription models tend to be really lucrative um, and a much lower entry level um, so that people don't really feel like they're spending so much money in one go. So money. Um, again, similar to the move to digital advertising, I think when we move to a virtual world, there is this expectation around 
things being sort of free or lower cost. And you can understand where that, ex that expectation comes from. But I think from an event point of view, it's really important to really think about what value are we getting from events? When we attend an event, we normally tend to in increase our knowledge on a particular topic or our skill level, or we're entertaining ourselves for looking at bands, artists, theatre, and an experience. Um, and all of these are valid from a virtual perspective. So um, I think I would question that, that concept of things having to be free, but you also obviously really need to communicate that value in your marketing. Um, certainly there's a challenge around networking in the B2B world. And I think that the best events really do make people feel like they are part of a community and building a community is gonna be the best way of again, sort of showing that value. Um, whether it's concierge matching services for um, senior people or for VIPs, um, or maybe it's um, using apps and algorithms to suggest content or individuals that are going to be interesting for you to meet. Again, the tech is kind of opening up a lot of opportunities here, but you need to create the right experience for your audience. Not everybody's going to be happy to build themselves an avatar and walk into a virtual room and have a coffee with someone. So you've really got to learn um, how tech savvy your audience is. Coming back to being agile, um, and this awful phrase, thinking outside the box, but really here again, it's kind of about building a digital component to safeguard yourselves, getting your platform right, um, and thinking outside the box for physical event spaces. When we are able to engage with each other from a physical point of view again, um, there's going to be a lot of outside spaces being used. There's going to be one-way systems like we're seeing in the, in the supermarket. Um, so how can you make this really effective for your delegates using tech, using apps to book time slots? That kind of thing can be um, a real time saver and make the experience uh, so much better when we're working in this sort of strange new world. A couple of events that I'd like to draw your attention to that are coming up next week that I think are going to be really interesting from a virtual point of view. The first one is Collision. Um, that's happening next week and um, uh, it is a paid for event. Um, they have been very bullish uh, about sort of talking a big game, uh, which I love, saying that people are going to really value um, the, the content, but also crucially the networking. So they will be connecting delegates on their app ahead of the event using automated content suggestions as well. So using those algorithms um, and using the tech to really make sure that you get the most out of the event. This event normally attracts about 25,000 people every year. And interestingly, for a tech conference, it's 50% women. So I'm really intrigued to see whether those numbers um, really, really grow, which I expect that they will. The second event is um, Lions Live, which is the Cannes Lion Creativity Festival. Um, that is also happening next week. And this event has taken the decision just for this year, given that the creative industries are having such a hard time at the moment um, in the post-COVID world to actually let people um, engage with this event for free. But they've made it very clear that that's a one-year decision only. And I think that they will be using it as a bit of a test case to start to run their event um, from a hybrid point of view moving forward. But again, they've played around with some really interesting um, content functions here, lots of pre-recorded content. So all of these at home uh, sessions with um, celebrities have all been pre-recorded, um, but they will be showing them live. So it still creates that special moment. Um, again, CMOs in the Spotlight is a, is a, a content partner um, uh, opportunity that they run with The Economist every year. They normally do these interviews on the beach um, at Cannes. So here they've just been doing the same thing, um, but again, pre-recording that content, but showing it live. So some closing thoughts. Um, I think virtual can really um, give you the opportunity to reach, create reach with um, new audiences. You're not restricted from a regional point of view. You can really take your proposition global. And business events have started to see numbers that I never expected to see at a, at a business event. So I think you know, from a B2B perspective, it's, it's just as exciting as it is from a B2C perspective. Um, even Beyonce, who normally at Coachella would have, um, would have performed to maybe um, a couple of hundred thousand people, um, she uh, live streamed her Coachella YouTube, uh, uh, her Coachella performance on YouTube, and she got to 41 million people from more than two, 232 countries. So even Beyonce can increase her audience, would you believe? So if she can do it, we can all do it. Um, I think the other thing I would say is, again, it's all about events. It's all about that intangible connection, creating electricity, anticipation and intrigue, which particularly at the moment where we're all um, finding the world um, 
very difficult and we're not able to necessarily see our loved ones as much as we want, um, creating those human moments. Um, and sometimes just tweaking the value of your own proposition in a slightly different way. So providing training, providing deep dives, providing um, enhancements to skill sets. Sometimes it's just about tweaking your own con content slightly to get people engaged from a virtual point of view. And I really think that that human connection um, is important uh, now, uh, probably more than ever. Thank you. Okay. Now I'm going to um, invite uh, Mark to uh, join me and um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the fantastic rewarding event, ser event series and the event that just ran um, because the FT were really first to market from a B2B point of view um, and so I thought it would be really interesting to um, get Mark's thoughts on how uh, the FT put together such a high profile and successful event so quickly um, and that decision to really kind of take the bull by the horns from a virtual perspective. Hi Victoria. Um, yes, yeah, so Global Boardroom. Um, Global Boardroom, uh, the, the, um, the idea originated in a, a meeting early April. Uh, where somebody put their hand up and said, I think this is the FT's chance to run our version of WEF Davos. Um, and we sat down and said, well, if we're ever going to do it, this could be the time to do it. We can run it virtually. We know we've got the circulation and the distribution of the FT globally. Um, we know now that we can truly bring in a global audience. We can bring in speakers from all around the world. Um, and that's how it originated. And then 41 days later, we were putting on a, an event for 53,000 people over three days um, with 25 hours of content with speakers such as Al Gore, Tony Blair, CEO of Volvo, CEO of Sanofi. Um, we had the uh, Secretary General of the OECD, uh, Chief Scientist of World Health Organization. Um, and that, that's kind of how it, how, how it took off. Um, but, but 41 days later from, a, from someone putting their hand up with an idea, we managed to, to deliver what we consider to be a, a fantastic event and just the start of what I think will now be a really um, sort of a great portfolio of events moving forward. Yeah, incredible success story. And it's not always the easiest to get um, editors to, to pull together on something like this. So. Um, I'm sure it was really exciting to start to see some of those big names come through. And I know a lot of companies have actually been finding that um, getting big names be kind of easier in a virtual world because um, we're all a little bit more available than perhaps we used to be. Um, the platform that you used for the event, I, I listened into it for both days, um, was really slick and, and, and no fuss, um, which is obviously really important for an FT audience um, and such a large audience, and it, it looked pretty seamless. Um, how did you select the, the platform that you used and, and what were your live experiences from a production point of view? Did it all actually go as well as it, as it looked from an audience perspective? Yeah, so initially we looked at um, third party providers and um, I think over the probably the last three months now, we must have looked at 25, 30 providers, sat through many demos, uh, looked at what the, you know, the unique selling points each of them have. But we actually decided that with the time we had, we didn't really have the time to ask lots of questions and not always get the response and the uh, result we wanted. So we decided to do everything ourselves. We decided to run it much more like a broadcast, live broadcast. So less about interaction, less of a conference feel, but much more of a broadcast. So we built the website, we built the player that we, that, that we ran the event on, we hired a production company, and we decided that with the time we had, that that would be the best way to, to move forward with that event. Subsequently, we're now looking for future events uh, as to whether or not we continue with that model, or we look at using one of the third parties um, of which some of the ones you highlighted earlier on one of your slides. So you're on 24s, you're busy those people like that. Audience engagement is really interesting in the virtual world. And, you know, we know that it's kind of changing all the time. Are, are you seeing any particular trends and patterns at the FT um, around audience behavior? And, and how's that is obviously it's so difficult to plan, but how's that informing your, your strategy moving forward? Yeah. So we're the, the, the thing that we're really learning very quickly is that, that people are, 
more distracted than ever. So I think when we first went into lockdown, we were thinking people would have more time on their hands. I think the reality is that we're all finding we have less. So there are so many more distractions. There are so many more video calls. There are so many more uh, webinars that we could be attending. We, lots of people have children, they're doing homeschooling, all that kind of thing. And what we've realized is that you can put the best content out but people will only attend these sessions that are most relevant to them. So over the boardroom, we ran 25 hours of, of content, but most people spent an hour, hour and 15 actually wasn't watching sessions. So they weren't engaged for the entire time. They watched an average of just under two sessions, but they watched yeah. the sessions that were relevant for them. They didn't sit and watch sessions that, that you know, they didn't really have an affiliation with. Absolutely. And I think that that's, that, you know, as we were saying, that doesn't matter what, what happened in the physical world, um, but it's just that now we can, we can see it so much more explicitly, maybe, um, from a virtual point of view. Yeah. Um, I know that the area that I get asked a lot about and um, the area that people are finding really difficult is the networking um, and kind of more intimate, intimate kind of roundtable uh, style events. It's very difficult to sort of have that discussion that you might have at a physical event over a glass of wine at the end of the at the end of the session. Um, what does the FTC is kind of here and what approaches and formats are you finding that are working for people to really connect um, connect people um, and really find that human interaction? Yeah, so we're still learning as we go. Um, it's still new to us. I think it's probably going to be the most difficult thing is to, is to try and try and facilitate networking in a, in a virtual environment. Um, what we're doing and the, the decision we've made at the moment is to base all of our networking around content. So mm -hmm. with the platform that we're going to be using for 90% of our, our multi-sponsored events moving forwards, um, we'll be running things like roundtables or um, uh, specific networking sessions around certain topics which are moderated by an FT editor. So bringing smaller groups of people together, that could be by industry, it could be by, by job function, it could be about the topic that, that, that they're wanting to learn about. Um, we're going to be running smaller events for maybe six, maybe eight, maybe even four people um, where we bring uh, people together in a virtual room similar to what we're on now um, and allow them to talk that way. So we think it's more important than ever that the content bring those people together and that is what will facilitate the networking. The platform does have things like live chat and things like that, but until we actually start running conferences, it's gonna be difficult to know how well that works. But for now, it's, it's definitely geared to, towards the, 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 the content that we can provide. Um, we've had a question through um in two years time do you predict virtual forums will be more profitable for conference companies than physical events great question um it, the reality is they're more profitable already um the margins on a on a on a virtual event is much better than a than a than a, a, a physical event face to face so the costs are much smaller than than uh, face to face events where you've got the costs of hiring hotels or or conference facilities providing all the food and beverage sometimes providing transport for people to fly um, from all over the world to speak at events, although the FT tend not to do that very much. Um, but, but, you know, our cost base is now dramatically shrunk. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, whilst the, the revenues maybe aren't as high as what they were before, the margins are definitely far higher than, than, than previously. So we're already seeing a, a shift. And I think that you know, from an FT perspective, we'll be running virtual events for, for many years to come now. Yeah. And um, what do you see at, as sort of the lasting changes um, to events in the future? Obviously, you, you kind of picked up on there that, um, you know, digital is now, digital events and virtual events are probably going to be part of your strategy moving forward. Um, but, you know, are there any other kind of, I guess, within that, um, is that, is that sort of deciding that you'll always have a digital portion of your event or, you know, what kind of lasting changes do you think we'll start to see across the industry? Yeah, certainly for, from an FT perspective, all of our events now are virtual for the rest of this year. So we made that decision early. Um, yeah. we think from everyone's perspective, whether it's delegates, speakers, sponsors, it's better to, to make that decision now and stick with it. Um, mm -hmm. so all of our events will be running virtual. I think as we move into 2021 and beyond, I think we'll see many more hybrid events. So as I think, as you mentioned earlier, that, that bringing people together still for that live face-to-face -face environment where people can network, 
but at the same time, why would you not stream that event globally? And in the case of Global Boardroom, interact with another 53,000 people worldwide who can see that content um, and be part of that event that may not have been able to attend if it was a one day conference in London. Um, now we have 157 countries, I think, were able to attend Global Boardroom, um, which is just incredible and would never happen for, for an FT event Absolutely. normally. Absolutely. There's questions coming in thick and fast. Um, what are the key reservations sponsors are having around virtual forums? Um, Mark, do you want to talk about that from the FT's point of view? Yeah, I think I think it goes back to that networking piece. I think yeah. most most people see the networking as as, as the biggest issue. Um, I don't think you're ever going to beat meeting someone and having a glass of wine with them at an end of a conference or being able to go and have a face-to-face -face meeting for 15 minutes in a room uh, at a face-to-face -face conference, but we can do the best we can virtually uh, to facilitate that. So whether it is smaller round table sessions or workshops, um, as I said earlier, I think the, the content will become more and more important to, to, to get that networking uh, working properly. Um, so that's, I think, is the, is the biggest issue that we're, we're facing with sponsors. Um, mm -hmm. But, but otherwise, I think people are buying into the fact that we can now deliver what I can see consider to be a better quality of speaker. So a perspective from all over the world, we can bring speakers in that um, from San Francisco, as an example, on one of our tech conferences that previously we would have been expecting them to give up a week of their time to fly over, attend the event, fly back, get jet lag. Um, now we can, we ask them to give up 45 minutes of their time and, we're able to attract speakers that we would probably never have been able to previously. Um, and then obviously there's the reach. As you mentioned earlier, we are now delivering events with 53,000 people um, over 200, 250 people. So um, there's, there's that reach piece. And then finally, one of the, I think the most exciting things, and you mentioned it earlier, was around data. Um, mm -hmm. We can now tell sponsors exactly who's engaged with their content. So who attended their session? We can tell them how many people ask questions. We can tell them who asked those questions. We can tell them who asked a poll, who answered a poll. We mm -hmm. can provide them with lots of data around how they engage with that particular session. So did they download a white paper? Um, all that kind of information is invaluable. Um, and mm -hmm. I, think that, I think that that's another thing that we can now offer that perhaps we couldn't always do previously at a face-to-face -face event. Okay. Um, another question uh, that's come in for you. Um, you mentioned that out of all of the attendees uh, for Glo Global Boardroom, um, they viewed approximately two sessions each. Um, uh, obviously, I was talking about Collision earlier and saying that they were, they're going to be using some algorithms to push content. Um, this person asked, are you going to be able to push people to other sessions that might be of interest? And is that something you will be trying to do for future large scale events? Yeah, so um, we'll be running parallel sessions and things like that now. So Global Boardroom, the plan is to, is to run specific sessions on specific industries or topic areas. Um, and the marketing that we do for those sessions will be geared towards specific audiences. So for example, if we were going to run a session on uh, automotive and the impact of COVID and what the automotive market is going to look like in 18 months, we can specifically market to that audience um, mm -hmm by the data that we have from conferences like our Future of the Car Summit that, that we've been running in the UK and US for a number of years now. So definitely, I think we'll be able to tailor content to audiences much more um, and people will have much more choice at a conference than perhaps they had previously. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of time um, and I know we've slightly run over. <laughs> so Mark, I wanna thank you so much for giving up your time today and for sharing um, some of those insights. I hope that everybody found the session um, useful. Um, and I just want to say on behalf of Microloan, um, I'm just getting my data up because we've been selling tickets right for this right up until um, 12 o'clock. So um, I just want to say on behalf of Microloan, thank you so much for buying a ticket and attending today. Um, as Gita said earlier, by buying a ticket, each one of you has changed the life of one woman living in poverty in sub-Saharan Africa. And because of you, a woman will be able to feed, clothe and educate her children. 
Um, and I'd also really like to thank our corporate sponsor for this event, which was the fabulous Gita, who gave um, the opening remarks and is founder and CEO of Nosh Detox. Um, we always love to thank our corporate sponsors and give a bit of information about them. So Nosh Detox is an organization which offers you a personalized combination of food or juice delivery or IV drips, lab testing and health coaching, um, where I know that Gita has um, really changed the lives of some of her clients. Um, and she will help you kind of reach your ultimate goal and they've generously supported this event with a cash donation um, today we were able to raise um, 1276 pounds so that's fantastic and this amount will go on to help 106 women receive the agricultural training that they need to start a small family farming business to feed their families which um, you know is really crucial at the moment because obviously post COVID-19 um, the countries that we support and the women that we support are going to probably find a that the next few months are really really tough. Um, if you enjoyed today's event then please do sign up for our next webinar uh, where Microlane will be welcoming, welcoming Terry Maloney from Salesforce who will be um, leading the conversation with some top leaders and mavericks in the field of sustainability um, and we'll be having speakers um, there from Visa and the sourcing team and our very own Medha Wilson who is the CEO of um, Microlane. So I just want to say thank you again um, to Gita and thank you again to Mark and we really appreciate it. Um, if you have any feedback on the session please do send it through um, and I do hope you all have a lovely rest of your Tuesday. Thanks everybody.